All right. Happy Sunday evening, everyone. Baker Fairburn Hockey Show is live ahead of the Sabres closing out their five game road trip through mostly through Western Canada. I'll do a formal introduction here. I am the schlub on the left, Chris Baker. You can find me on Twitter at Sabres Prospects. And on the right, the very handsome young gentleman, Matthew Fairburn from The Athletic. So before we begin, as always, I got to get through the nuts and bolts like this video. If you could, please subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know when the Baker Fairburn Hockey Show goes live and you can find the audio version of the Baker Fairburn Hockey Show on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could, please leave a five star review. And in the comments, tell us what you want the Sabres to do at the draft. I have an idea. I'm already thinking about the draft, Matthew Fairburn, but we also have three months to talk about the draft. And we're not going to do that tonight because we only have about 40 minutes here before puck drop and we might as well get right to it. I've been teeing up the last couple of episodes of the Baker Fairburn hockey show talking about meaningful March hockey trademark. And I think mathematically it's still meaningful March hockey tonight, but look, Sabres took one on the chin on Thursday night, eight, three loss in Edmonton. So they're now one in three on this five game road trip. Still some hope here four, five and one in their last 10. But I think, um, what is it? Eight points out of a playoff spot here with 11 games left on the schedule. You pretty much have to run the table, right? So win tonight, keep the dream alive, come back home and you have a five game homestand there. You got to run the table there, right, Matthew? But that Edmonton game, man, you know, tied three, three, through 40 minutes, you get two goals from J.J. Paterka, who's now up to, what, 23 on the season. You get a goal from Victor Olsen, who's been a pretty nice little part to have here all of a sudden since the trade deadline. But what happened in that game? I mean, you know, because, like, I mean, that game is kind of, like, representative, I think, of the big picture, right? Like, do you believe in miracles? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, where are you at coming into tonight, coming off of that game, an 8-3 loss? Did they quit? You know, I, I wasn't sure whether the Q word was 100% appropriate. You can never get inside guy's head and all that. But there's no question that they were entirely deflated in that game, right? And they, whether you want to say quit, whether you want to go that far or not, they fell apart mentally and then that you can't do that against a team like the Edmonton Oilers. I think they just crumbled and whether that was just the, all the air coming out of the balloon and them realizing that was it. But yeah, the, the Q word might be appropriate though. Doesn't it feel like they quit on their goalie a little bit that the, the last few goals got me because it was like, you know, the, the air coming out of the balloon throughout the third period made some sense. You know, you lose a game five, three, you lose a game six, three to let it get to that point for the goalie, who is the only reason that you're even in this situation. Uko Pekalukinen has played out of his mind for this team. And then you end up like that. It's just like, he's getting odd man rushes left and right and no support. You have to be better for him, if nobody else, if you don't have the, the, you know, if you don't have it for yourself or for the playoff chances or whatever else, Uko Pekalukin and I thought deserved a lot better than he got. So to your point, it felt kind of like the season a little bit, right? Just when things get close, they start falling apart again. And it goes back to a question I asked Don Granado when he was at some point early maybe some point in january early february all-star breakish talking about how the team was getting better at handling the pressure and i asked him are they getting better at handling the pressure or is the pressure gone you're 10 points out of a playoff spot it's easy to to play free and fearless when you theoretically have nothing to lose and i think what we saw happen was when the pressure creeped back in it got to them again they lose in Detroit. They beat Seattle. Then they lose a close one to Vancouver and get the doors blown off them in Edmonton. Going into this road trip, they were, it was real. The whole playoff push looked real. And they've gone one and three since then. 
And that's a, an issue that they need to seriously look at because once again, we're looking at a team that when the pressure increased, I think their play went down and they played a tight game against Vancouver. You know, they, they played well against Seattle. They were in it against Detroit, but again, it's not a participation thing, right? It's not points for trying. This is about to be 13 seasons with no playoffs. So, so nobody really wants to hear about that. They want the results in, if you're better at performing under pressure, you get more than one win in four absolutely crucial games on this trip to the point where now this fifth game, I'm not, I don't even think I'm ready to put it into the bucket of uh, meaningful games in March. I, I think they're toast. Yeah, it's kind of tricky. And thanks for bringing up the uh, Seattle and Vancouver games, by the way. I was out of town. So actually, full disclosure for our audience, I did not see those games. You wanted to go live on Thursday. I wasn't comfortable going Thursday. I didn't have anything teed up. So that's on me, okay, for anyone that was looking for the Baker Fairburn Hockey Show on Thursday. Send the hate mail to Matthew, but that's my fault that we are not going live until now. But, um, you know, back to Don Granado's comments about the pressure, you know, I wonder if he was right. Was he on or were, did they just find a goaltender that could handle the pressure? Ukopeka Lukanen, that's kind of the stat of the day that I pulled up and, and wrote down in preparation to chat with you tonight. He's allowed three or fewer goals in 26 of his last 28 games. You could argue that they found a goaltender that could handle the pressure, but the team in front of him has still been not there. And I think it's come to your point. That's come to light on this trip here. This, this was must win hockey. You can't go, you know, they have to win tonight, but even then you win tonight and you're two and three on a five game road trip, road trip when you probably had to win at least four, if not all five. So yeah, it's tricky, but you know, they do have some things going for them tonight coming into the Calgary game. Um, some of the things I wrote down, this is a city in Calgary where they've won four of their last five on the road. And, you know, as far as some of the guys that were kind of beaten on here, the skaters, um, you know, I think you have Tage and Tuck both have four game point streaks coming in tonight. But again, I mean, so what at this point? Because that's all, that's also been something that's been, I think, a, a, just a critical mark on this team is, you know, Paterka was a guy that we talked about coming into the season. He's had the breakout that you and I both kind of forecasted for him. He's up on that top line now. Secondary scoring has been inconsistent. You got to get more out of those other guys. So I, I'm really curious to see what they do tonight. But, um, you know, back on that Edmonton game, the game that the recent game that I did get a chance to watch, I was texting you during that game. And it's like the only real thing, like was the Owen power offsides, like not gaining the zone. Was that the, like, I don't even think that was the turning point. It was unfortunate, but they were moving in a really good direction. Was that like the bag deflator for them? Do you think? Because like he had Rusek and Olafson breaking into the zone with speed. And the only thing that I wrote down is that the best teacher of the game is the game. And he won't make that mistake again, but that was bad timing for that mistake. And then the thing it's just, they hung they hung with the Oilers a little bit after that, but man, that was a bag deflator. I don't know what your take was on that singular play before we move on with a, a chance to really take charge of a game. Right. And you, you miss that chance. And then when things start getting away from you on the other end, you know, that's one that you would want back, but I think you just can't have those things continually be bag deflators. Right if it happens once in a while and you're third in the division and you lose eight to three on the road, you lose eight to three on the road and, and you chalk it up and move on. But you can't have singular plays deflating you. You can't have singular games causing you to spiral. You can't have the fact that people are talking about the standings start rattling the team. It should excite the team. You know, I, I, I was before they left for the road trip talking to Alex Tuck about it. And, you know, I was like, you know, it's crazy because I had talked to him down in Florida and the tone of the conversation was sort of, you know, debriefing almost what had gone wrong, almost as if the season was, was kind of, we were both, you know, pretty clear on where the season was at that point heading into the deadline. And I said, can you believe, you know, where it's at? Here you are. And like, you're in a playoff push. He says, well, yeah. 
He's like, you guys can't stop talking about it, <laughs> which, you know, that should be what you want, right? And I think it is what Alex Tuck wants. He was excited by it. But the fact that everybody was talking about it seems like it seeped into the team again. Now, they might dispute that. Don Granado might dispute that. I don't know. But the results are the results. And you mentioned that Owen power play, and it just makes me think about where this team is like where and where they're going because if singular plays cause things to go down a slippery slope in a game if singular games do it to you in a season that's what is interesting about the last 10 11 games for me is it's still major evaluation mode and i think there were people who were worried that the three game winning streak and it was just a three-game winning streak. Doesn't it feel like it was a 10-game winning streak, the energy it brought for a little while? Yeah. That three-game, like that, I mean, number one takeaway for me above everything else is how badly people around here want to buy in, as negative as people can be and as angry and upset as they can be. They are looking for an excuse to buy in because that three-game winning streak felt, like I said, like a 10-game winning streak, the way people were were jumping back on you know, the bandwagon, at least, you know, on social media and stuff. Well, but, and also, by the way, in the locker room, like you, yeah. you gave Tuck the uh, playoff percentages and he told you, it feels you like said, what, it was five or eight. And he said, it feels like more. So it wasn't just right. you and I, or the people in the chat, the fan base, it was the players themselves. Yeah. You could feel it. And that just goes to show you how badly people around here are ready to ready to be heard again, as they say, right? They're, they're willing to throw themselves headfirst into it. But there was a, a concern I saw from some people, commenters, you know, and maybe even some people in the chat when we went live that, you know, would this run change the outlook on the off season internally from Kevin Adams and Don Granado? And that's a, a fair concern and a, and a fair question because you don't want the as uh you know the heroic run to ninth place or whatever to obscure what really needs to happen and so in that sense maybe this little losing streak you know starts to open their eyes to the change that is needed and you bringing up those numbers about uko pekalukanen to me when they're doing their off season evaluation, right? And you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, what went right? What went wrong? How close are we? What needs to be done? If you're the Sabres, how much of your even slim, slim playoff hopes that you had for what, a week? It was like a week where the playoffs felt real because before that, it, it, there was no point in the season up until then where it felt like they were in it at all. Yeah, and they no. were felt like it maybe for a week and then now it's gone. And the only reason, maybe not the only reason, but I would say a big percentage of the reason is because of your goaltending. A goaltender who yes, they misevaluated, would it be fair to say? I don't know. Maybe that, not. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't know if that's maybe fair he to say. earned I think just... maybe he earned where he was as the number three coming into yeah. the season. But yeah, a goalie that let's say they weren't counting on, right? It wasn't necessarily the plan for this season. They were waiting on. Right. They As they waited on. out, they weren't sitting here yeah. saying, this season is going to go well because Uko Pekalukunen is going to take the next step. They were not banking on that. And no. the fact that he did made it so that they were afloat in March. You know, they, they were still there. But outside of that, there's still a lot to poke holes in and a lot that they need to fix. So without Uko Pekalukunen rattling off, what, 26 of 28 games? Is that what you said? 26 With of 28, uh, 26 of his last 28, three goals or fewer allowed. And then, and one of those is the, the big one in Edmonton, right? So, so without so, that, where are they? No, it's smoke and mirrors. That's, what, that's where I'm landing on this season to date is that they had that run. You just talked about that week where everyone was feeling good. If you take a step back and you look, the they've been a flawed roster from the start. We've talked about that ad nauseum. 
And it took me a little while to get into the point of agreement with you. That's been your point all season long, that when Quinn went down, they didn't address it. That contributed to the slow start. And not having maybe, like, the, the Uko Pekalukinen was not like a standout from the beginning of the season either. He also had to work his way into rhythm. But when he got going, that's when things got better. When Jack Quinn came back in the lineup, that's when things got better. I'll make that argument. I've said that all along. I think that he's the, like, just changes the way they look. I've said it a million times. But what does that say about Tage and Tuck and Darlene and these guys are supposed to carry you, the inconsistency? You can talk maybe Tage has had some injuries, right? But at the end of the day, my point is, I think the goaltending has masked, and that's your point, it's masked the big issues on this team. So in reality, yeah, it'd be a lot worse if Lukanen didn't figure out how to play in the NHL and get his game going. That's a crazy stat, though, that 26 of his last 28. But it also, there's another way to look at it, right? Do you have a problem solved? Do you feel good about your goaltending moving forward? Because that's a critical piece. If you want to look for positives, hang your head on that one. But man, they have some fixing to do. And to me, it's all up front. Yeah, it's it's interesting to consider where they go from here because a big thing that they have, or at least Don Granado is the one who has to talk to us, you know, every day over over a hundred times a season, basically between morning skates and post games and practice days, and so he becomes the voice of what they're thinking as an organization. And he does work in tandem in some ways with Kevin Adams, as we saw in the embedded, you know, he's, mm -hmm. this is not, uh, you know, two separate silos and it's always been that way. So I preface, you know, this by saying, you know, Don Granado has brought up their defensive improvement a lot and they have improved defensively, but not dramatically. They've improved in goals against dramatically, but, to our previous point, they have a really good goaltender right now. They have the best goaltender maybe in the NHL since January 1st. The defense has improved, but it's gone from basically the worst in the NHL to, I don't know, somewhere between like 18th and 22nd, you know, somewhere in that below yeah. average tier. So you didn't become an elite defensive hockey team. And in the process, you lost a massive chunk of your offense, particularly your power play. So you don't want to sit there and now I think the defense is probably mostly taken care of at this point. They have a decision to make on Yogi Haru, but they, you know, you make yeah. the move for Bo Byram and you kind of solidified your defense, but it's a team defense approach. And that's, that's where point. I'm going. Right. Yes. Your point about fixing the forwards as we've talked about all year, is changing who they have, the types of players that they have, the balance, the roles, the identity of different lines. So I don't think they should sit there and think that they figured out how to play defense with the current group. I think the blue line's okay. And I think they have gotten better system-wise, but I don't think they can kid themselves into thinking that because Uko Pekalukinen was great, everything is fine. It's one problem solved for now, as we've seen with goalies. Uh, I referenced in a mailbag, somebody asked me what I thought of Lukanen's next contract, and I referenced uh, Gustafson out in Minnesota. Three That's years, 3.75. Yeah. To me, it's kind of perfect if you want to go that three years. If you want to go four or five, then you're in that four to five million range, I think. If you go four to five years on term, you're going to have to give them a little bit more. But if you want to hedge your bet a little bit, three years is the way to do it. And stats wise, timeline wise, prospect wise, he's pretty similar to to Gustafson, and he's fighting it this year. You know, he's he's having a tough time. So I don't I don't have any reason to sit here and think Uko Pekalukinen is going to that this was some sort of anomaly. But counting on him, he could he get continue to get better? Yes, counting on him to be what he's been since January first is risky flawed i would say because he's the only reason you're here and he is playing about as good as any goalie in the league over the last three months so if you're counting on a repeat of that 
you're still going to need more because it wasn't enough to get you here. And to me, every, to your point, everything seems like it starts up front with the off season plan. And yep. that's where they did nothing last year. Defense was where they were fixing stuff. They did nothing at forward. The only new body was 18 year old Zach Benson. So I think they know it. I think Kevin Adams knows it. I think he's, you know, even just swapping out Akposo and they're going to have open spots to play with for sure. And that's where they need to devote a lot of their attention because another thing you brought up about Jack Quinn and how different they are with Jack Quinn and they absolutely are. The trouble with that is he's been injured a lot. And he's been injured. Our, he's 22 years old also, right? Like, right. And to our point over, you know, probably in the beginning of the season, whenever we were talking about this, you knew he was hurt in June and did nothing. And anybody on the outside was looking and saying, boy, you might want to replace that guy. And yes, he came back and he played well, but by the time he came back, they were already trying to climb out of a hole because their whole forward group was, was out of whack and, we could go down a lot of rabbit holes on why they got off to a slow start. Uh, I think Quinn's injury was part of it. I think how they handled training camp was part of it with having, you know, Tuck Skinner and Tage split up prospect on each line and then just throwing them together and then just yeah. throwing them thinking it'll work. And then you get off to a slow start. They had so many bodies in camp. It took them a while to whittle down to the actual group that was going to be there. You had Clifton on a pair with Darlene all through camp and then just scrapped that right before the season. And Clifton plays, you know, not great for 25 games as he's trying to figure things out with a new partner after spending all of training camp with one. So there's a lot of things that played into it, but you know, Jack Quinn has been banged up and Jack Quinn is still young to your point, the depth, the layers of, you know, different identities and different flavors that you can bring to a forward group. They have an opportunity to rebuild it this off season in a sense. And I'm really mm -hmm. curious how they handle it because action is the only thing that will truly tell you how Kevin Adams feels, right? How they handle it. What they thought was that last year's group was good enough. And you've brought this up a few times. They did almost the exact same thing. If you go back to this date last year, they did almost the exact same thing. I mentioned that last week. This It was St. Patrick's Day where they started to lose. They went into another slump. They lost a few games, and they played themselves out of it. It's a pattern. And then they, won this, they went on this big winning streak and convinced themselves Devin Levi fixed everything that was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Everything out, the, the quote from Don Granato that, stuck with me when he and I sat down for a Q and a over the summer, he said, this group earned the right to basically have the first crack at pushing us over the edge to which I thought, well, how long does that last? Apparently, you know, when you've set your roster, it lasts a whole season, right? With Quinn, with Quinn healthy, I would say, yeah. And even without Quinn, I was willing to give it a chance thinking but that he was already hurt maybe... at that point. He was already hurt yeah. when we were talking. So, well, so, and that's the other thing, though, is like, you know, you go back in the season, we're going to talk about this a lot over the next couple of months, but like Kulik didn't get the call when he was hot in the beginning of the season. He played one game, what was it, 13 minutes. Isak Rosane played, what, six games. He had one really good game. I think it was a Detroit game. Other than that, a lot of those other young guys didn't get a look. Savoy, I would, I would argue that probably mismanaged to keep a third goalie up or Bryson and pulled the plug on him way too fast. He could have helped him. Maybe. You don't know. He, he barely had a cup of coffee and got no shot. He was playing pretty so well. Some of those NHL. he was, he was, yeah, I think he had five points in six games, something like that. Right. But and the, I know this isn't prospect Avenue, but boy, oh boy, did he finish <laughs> the regular season pretty strong out there in Moose. Yeah. And by, by the way, people season. should be excited. People should be excited for him. And I, actually I want to get to that. We're going to get to that in a second, actually. Well, let's just go to there now because I started thinking about this today. And it kind of plays into what we saw in the embedded. Let's just kind of, my two points, let's kind of blend them together here a little bit. So in the embedded, you and I have talked about the next captain. Like in, in training camp next year, I'm sure that's when Kevin Adams will make the announcement. I think it's pretty clear that it's, and a lot of people are already on this, but Rasmus Dahlin, I don't think there's any question now 
is like minus 800 on the sports books to be the next captain of the Sabres. I don't think there's any question. Seeing how the behind the scenes of the Akposo trade went down, Kevin Adams picks up the phone and calls, calls Darlene. Like, I think that implies the comfort comfort level that the general manager has with this player who's going to be the next version of Kyle Akposo. The baton seemingly was handed off there. But where I was going, and, and I know you agree with that, so I'm not even going to throw it to you right now. I know you agree with that, even though I still want to maybe push the Cousins thing a little more. He's going to be in the leadership group. Definitely not the captain, though. Let's just be clear on that. But what I was thinking is there's a shift a little bit. We've, it, like in the media, fans have talked about the connection with Granado and the United States National Team Development Program, whether it's Tuck, Thompson, Greenway, Clifton, you can throw in that bucket. But I think that there's this emerging presence here, you know, and throw throw Samuelson in that national team development program bucket too. There is a WHL flavor on this team moving forward. That's going to be, they're going to be the guys that make this happen. It's Benson, it's cousins, it's Bo Byram and Savoy is coming. Savoy is coming. I think fans should be excited for this kid. I don't care that he had a four point night in Moose Jaw last night. It's not about that. It's about the way that he plays, the speed, that injection of what's missing in the Sabres lineup right now. He's fearless. He competes similar to Benson, compete level. Benson just has a different brain. We've talked about it. But I think you're going to see, keep an eye on that. In the draft moving forward, I just think there's something about those players. They're starting to hit. They have a scout there that they seem to trust, Lucas Sutter. But those guys, man, that WHL cluster is going to be super crucial moving forward to this team while you still have your Tage and your Tuck and your Dolly and all those guys doing their thing. Keep an eye on that. That, The fabric of that team, Kevin wants to talk about the fabric of the team, it's going to be these WHL guys. Yeah, you need to have... Look, it was kind of the same way when I covered the Bills and everybody would make a running joke of the Carolina pipeline, right? When Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott took over. And they're bringing all these guys in from Carolina. I don't have a huge problem with that. Just like I don't have a huge problem with Granado finding guys he's comfortable with that know him. We've talked plenty about the challenge of getting players to Buffalo, right? In hockey in particular, when you're not winning. So if that's a way to get some guys, some of which are good, right? You know, these are some good players. Then sure. As you're starting to transition, but to your point, you build the core of your, your strategy is building it through the draft. Your strategy is to patiently draft and develop your own players. And that's when you get to do it yourself, right? Don Granado is not coaching 17 year olds anymore. So it doesn't matter who's at the program or who's at, you know, uh, the connection isn't the same. And so the program was probably the Sabres version of the Carolina pipeline. To the yeah, place, right? it, it felt like it because Don Granado didn't have a previous NHL job. Neither did Kevin Adams. So they didn't have, you know, things to, you know, hang their hat on in that way. So you had to dip back into his time coaching at the program, which again is fine. And same with Seth Appert, right? He, he's he got a connection to a lot of those guys, which he came after Don, so he got to coach Samuelson and, and whatnot. But it's a good and smart point by you because it's encouraging in terms of the type of player that they're looking for. And we discussed a little bit about there's two competing schools of thought or even in my own head when you can think about everything that went wrong this season or last season or in the off season that makes you question what they're doing, whether it's Kevin Adams, Don Granato, the whole group. But then we discussed a few weeks ago, if you're going to commit to a draft and develop approach, you do have to be a little bit patient. And the part that does not concern me right now is the drafting. So far, it's early, right? We haven't seen all these guys become NHL players, but 
if they're dipping into a certain type of player in the Western League, they seem to be kind of on onto something. I think Savoy could be ready to impact this team next year. Benson already impacted it this year and should be ready to take another step next year. Cousins wasn't their pick, but Byram was a trade. Cousins is clearly their kind of guy, right? You know, they that they developed and I think has the, the right style of hockey play. that they play in the Western League that they don't play in the queue. You see a little bit in the Ontario League, but there's a style of hockey there also. And I didn't I didn't want to step on you, but Krebs I, is a Western Leaguer as well. Well, Krebs is, and you and you can say Yoki Haru is too. He played in the Portland Winterhawks, you know, but I didn't I left those two out on purpose. So okay. But and I don't want to get carried away and thinking, oh, it's just going to be all WHL. I think there's going to be this undercurrent there, though, with how they draft moving forward. And by the way, I even told you what my draft strategy is. I should just blow your mind now. You want to get better? You want to address your top six? Look to trade that that first round pick this year. Do something radical. Let's go. Let's go. Well, and then I also, I don't have to talk as much on that opening night with Duffer and Marty. I'm off. Well, that's it. that's definitely a drawback. I'm there though. Always good to to talk with Duffer and Marty as much as possible. <laughs> but I was remember if you remember before the deadline, I said the pick should be off limits at the deadline. It should be off limits until the lottery. As soon as you know it's not, you know that you haven't jumped way up, then, you know if it's in that ten to to twelve range, yeah, it's on it's on the table. Because one of the best ways to remake this forward group, I think, is to add something to the top six to push some guys down the lineup into more appropriate roles. And add it's easier to add bottom six guys in free agency than it is to attract one of the big fish to come to Buffalo. So a trade is the better way to do that, to your point. And that draft pick, if it's on the table, could get you something. It, you're it you're loaded right now in the prospect ranks. You can trade some prospects. That's what everyone wanted to do earlier. It's the same thing, basically. And if you really like your prospects, like if you've hit on your your draft picks already and you like your Kulik and you like Austin and Savoy and these guys, keep them. Play with house money. Move out the pick. I'm like, we're going to talk about this because you have to almost forecast. Like, obviously, it doesn't happen a lot, I don't think, where you, you know, I can only remember like a pick going for a player. It was like 2013. I think that was Corey Schneider got traded 2013 Vancouver. Cause I remember we were doing the broadcast of the draft from the Lexus club. That's when Vancouver took Bo Horvat, you know, now I'm not, I'm just trying to think of like trading a pick for a player. I can't remember like a precedent, but you know, and that's the other thing too. Like the caps going up, teams might have more ability, but there's going to be a team that's going to be in a pinch. De Burncat was a uh, a couple years ago, wasn't was that, that a high a draft weekend trade? I think and so. Like a top top ten pick that the Senators yeah, maybe. helped for him. It didn't work out. Yeah, but. I mean, we have three months to talk about yeah. this, but I, I that was my epiphany today when I was just like, you know, I think we I think we want to get on that train. At least look at it, analyze it. Save like I said, wait for the lottery. Make sure you're not a, you know, yeah, you're I mean, trading. Obviously, one. they have to. The deadline's passed, but. Uh, yeah, you know, and you got to wait till the off season to execute any type of trade now. So we'll see where it's at. It's I like sure your idea. Though. Like, let's top. just let's go. And they've also been decent at finding players beyond round one, right? So or late in round one, like Yuri Kulik. So if you have to get rid of one of those high picks, so be it. Well, here's part of it too. The type of player that you need to get into the prospect ranks right now that are going to be those meat and potatoes guys that when I always say like speed, energy, grit, attitude, those are day two type of players. Those are second and third round picks. Anyways, you know, of course you always want more skill. You always want good hockey players. Just draft, draft the best hockey player. I get it. I get it. But I'm willing to take a little bit of a different look this year, especially again, if you really like the guys that you have now, there's going to be really good players there. I'm sure. Say the Sabres get the ninth overall pick or something. There's going to be a good player there. That's going to be very hard to move off of for sure. And then you default to, okay, maybe, maybe I trade one of the smaller skill guys. It might not fit into what I need to be moving forward. We're going to, we were going to talk about all this stuff, but today when I was out walking the dogs, I was like, kind of like the idea, kind of like the idea. 
I didn't mind the idea last year. And it goes to show you the other side of the coin, right? Is that I wouldn't have argued with trading the 13th overall pick and then it becomes Zach Benson. So you have to wonder yeah. how that how that filters into their thinking where they're, you know. <laughs> and then he's one of your best players this year. What a kick in the nuts that would have been. Right. Did you guys exactly. not having the goaltending and not having Benson? I know Benson hasn't lit the world on fire statistically, but he's been a like a glue guy in the lineup on many nights. He really has. And you imagine if he was doing that somewhere else with the pick, right? You know, you wouldn't want to, you better have gotten a good player. Who knows? But would he have been know. in the NHL this year if he was drafted by another organization? No, he might have been Probably back in Wenatchee not. with Savoy, you know? <laughs> Maybe he would have been a, I don't know if Moose Jaw would have had enough draft picks to get both him and Savoy for their yeah, right. deadline push, but well, that would have yeah, been they couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Connor Geeky got traded the same day to Swift Current. Um, so let's um we only have like a couple minutes left. I don't know if you start anything in the chat. I really haven't. I've been enthralled in this discussion, and then I just kind of dropped the bomb on you that we should move the pick. Um, Captain Ahab did uh compliment you on a point that you were making about Granado being very good at developing boys. These are men and need to be treated as men and not coddled. Yeah, they're men, but they're not, <laughs> many of them are not very much older than boys. And that's part of the problem. I think that you have with the Sabres team right now. I catch um, myself often super in, the young. Locker room. I, in the locker room. I catch myself. It happened to me the first time last year when I was talking to Tage Thompson about one of the younger players. And I, I said to him as one of the older guys in the room, and he said, well, I don't know if I, I would be, I'm an older guy. And I was like, yeah, yeah. you kind of are. <laughs> sorry. You can, you can shave. Sorry, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you know, sorry, dude. Like, uh, I don't mean to call you old, but yeah, you know, you kind of are. And there's, they're so young. I mean, they're going to get a little older next year, I guess. Right. Six months older, uh, in September, but oof, they are young. Clinton's kind of like, this is the type of, like, this is why you would consider moving the pick. And of course, you know, it comes with your taking on salary. To me, you want to get like a, a Kirill Kaprizov, Kaprizov, however you want to say it. I say it both ways every five minutes. Kaprizov, we'll call him. Um, yeah, I mean, if you can swing something like that, I mean, it's a swing for the fences type of move. Um, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Like, because what, what have we talked about, Matthew? You're going to get a player and pop him in the top six. Yeah. You, you know, and, and what are you trading if it's not prospects? I mean, I don't know, man. Even if does, does prospects get it done? I don't know, you know, but or it's a prospect in that pick to really swing. I, I think you have to look at everything. And it's not really a desperation move either. You have some pretty good players here. It's just not coming together. You might be missing that one piece. You know? I don't want to get crazy, can, but let's get it crazy. Can change everything. Because you're you're changing multiple lines by doing that, right? You're slotting players into more appropriate spots in the lineup. You can add in some of the the grittier guys, you know, in in free agency. You know, pay them a little more, right? Overpay a little bit. Look, for, man, uh, you there's a hole, Matthew. Or something. Yeah. Well, there, but right? there's a hole, right? Like you went into this critical playoff run, and for half of these must win games, you had Zemgis Gergensen's on your top line, man. Right. You, Jeff Skinner down to the third. They're telling you that there's going to be a hole there next year, right? And how are you going to get it? I don't know. A couple different ways to get it, but that's one thing. Again, I, I'm not going to beat the dead horse now because I have three months to beat that horse to talk about it. And they don't just have the pick at their disposal. They have a loaded pool of prospects who that's won't point, all man. So somebody's got to go, right? That's where you sit there. If you're Kevin Adams, talk to your scouts. What's available at pick 10, pick nine? How do we feel about it versus not just, you know, the prospects in their system, but there's a comfort level there, right? Or talk to your development staff. Who do you, who's not coming along the way we hoped? Let's be honest about it because you know, as an organization, more than other teams know about how your guys are coming along and how you feel. This, about it. sorry to step on you. This comment from Cummings is part of the reason why I default to maybe looking at trading something that's not a known asset right now in terms of a player. That electric explosive speed with Savoy is a dimension they don't have. Willingness to go where the goal scorers go. That's exactly what Matthew Savoy does. That's part of the reason why I say people should be excited about him. And that it's a known element that you can forecast into your roster. If it's not next year, it's quickly into the season, maybe after some seasoning. 
you can you can make the same statement of praise about Oslin. And you know what you have in Kulik. You have some players there that you like that are moving in a really good direction and are still very young. And if you can keep them and move that pick and get a player now and create more competition, it makes sense, man. It makes sense. But um, it's a good hey, point. It's 58. Yeah, but they, they what do we puck drop? 907? We're not going to yeah, okay, drop right at nine. Over. We can go a couple more right. for the chat. Cummings makes a really good point about speed. We talk about this being a young team, and Granado talks about pace a lot. The speed is missing in certain spots, right? You know, and I think, you know, Savoy is one of those players that really does bring that element that you notice it in a game like Edmonton, right? And not just Connor McDavid, but the speed that a team like that plays with versus the speed the Sabres play with. Do they have those top, top speed guys? Tuck's pretty fast. You know, Tate yeah. can get rolling for a bigger guy, but just from a pure pace standpoint, I think Savoy does add a lot as long as, you know, he's ready. You know, different to, speed Savoy. with Savoy and Tuck. Like Savoy's got the afterburners on quite a bit. Tuck is still very, like, it's some, sometimes pacing himself to manage his minutes in the game. That's that tread on the tire thing that we've talked about. Um, I don't know, man, there's so many scenarios and so many options that we can talk about. If you put that pick in play, you can use it to move back and get a player. Part of the reason why I'm on that pick thing, and this is the last thing I'll say, because again, we have like another 90 days to talk about it, is you got to get older, you got to get some experience, you got to, you know what I mean? And that seems like a, a straighter path to getting it done. It's a tremendous asset if it's a top 10 pick. You know, do you do it if you're second, third overall? Probably not. You do it if you're nine, 10, 11. 100 percent 100 percent you get into yeah. that eight nine ten mode that's where you get you know stuck with maybe an alex nylander you know would you rather have a player a known commodity that boosts your average age you know it's got some term you're gonna pay him some bucks or nylander <laughs> it's two well, ways to look at it you you bring well, that, up the benson thing which yeah, is good i'll bring up the nylander thing <laughs> and that's why you have to look at the class you have to you know see how you feel and you have to find a partner, right? A, a trade yep. partner who feels, you know, pretty good about a player in that spot. Usually that has to happen ahead of the draft. Seems like on the draft floor, a lot of that doesn't happen, although it can. And I'm for it. I, I really am because the window is supposed to be now, right? And yes, you want to stack layers of prospects and time them right and be ready to sustain success and all that but you can't sustain success until you've had some success so go out and get somebody that can help you do that next year because it's not being impatient to talk about that it's not because you made all three of the picks in 2022 you made the pick last year you made a couple of picks in owen powers draft dude you're loaded there's almost too many Chris Baker's computers are overworking over there. They're it gonna is. Break down. Things going to be completely fried. And we need to, you know, that that is the hub of the Baker Fairburn hockey show. So if your computers start frying, we're in trouble Actually, for no is. other reason. Yeah. That's we why That's why they need to start uh, <laughs> they need to start trimming some of these some of these prospects from the ranks. There's a last thing I'll say on that, okay? Um I wanted to talk about the Calgary game. I really did. I wanted to just kind of tee it up, but we, we, the chat knows what they got to do here. They know what's going on. I will say this. The Baker Fairburn hockey show was ahead of the Casey Middlestat scenario that led to him being traded. Maybe we'll be ahead of the next big move that they make in the off season. That's going to be trading the first round pick. We'll see. Um, it's nine Oh two. I'm not trying to run from everyone. We have good numbers still here in the chat, but I do want to be there for puck drop. Anything else that you want to throw up or do you just want to throw up after I, watching this road trip? <laughs> we'll see how it finishes to be determined uh, on, on what, how we'll be feeling in, in a couple of hours, but tough stretch for them. But a really, to me, it's an exciting time to be, to be talking about these guys and writing about these guys because they are really heading into what is now 
it's a turning point off season because I think yeah, when we yeah. bring up that that first round pick trade, the thing that also pops into my head, how many GMs get to go five years without making the playoffs? I know. Kevin Adams is going into year five next season. I want him to be the guy that gets the franchise in the playoffs. I want Kevin. I believe in Kevin, believe it or not. I want him to be the guy. And so um, he should feel some urgency to yeah. push the fast forward button a little bit. The Bo Byram trade was encouraging in that regard. Interested to see how he finishes the road trip, by the way. Hot start to his Sabres career, and he has cooled off a bit in recent games. But the Don, Don Granado gets a lot of the attention for being on the hot seat, and it was the lead subject in my mailbag the other day after the Edmonton game because people wanted to place him right back on the hot seat after that for good reason. I said what I've said for months, that it would be more than justified, but that doesn't seem like the route that they're going. Kevin Adams, to your point, I, I've been encouraged by some of the things that he's done. I have, you know, you have to let some of these patient things take root a little bit, these these prospects and the development strategy that's in place. But five, do you get to go five years without making the playoffs? That has to be on his mind. We can tell, I think, that he's getting a little bit impatient with the current group. Not to mean he should panic and blow everything up because that's the whole reason you patiently drafted and developed in the first place. But trading a pick for a good player is not doing that. And it's getting you to the point where five years in, you can say enough is enough. After the fifth year of his general manager tenure should end in the playoffs. Otherwise, it's going to be his job that everybody's talking about instead of Don Granado's. If I don't hit the objective for five straight years in my job, I'm probably not in that job. If you don't, get good reviews from your superiors at the athletic for five years, you're probably not going to be right in there very long. Different industries. I understand, but it also just kind of, that's your point, right? It's a results oriented business, pretty much every business. So I'm with you, man. Rebuilds take time. It's different in hockey than it is in other sports. I understand all those things. And I think we've been, you know, understanding and patient of, uh, of Kevin Adams, but, I think that might factor into his headspace in the off season a little bit. And, you know, a few people in the chat brought it up. There's only so many avenues you have in, in the sense that reagents are not going to have Buffalo at the top of their list. Certainly not this off season. So how do you do that? You got to go trade. You got to make trades and it's not easy. And it doesn't to have do. to be pick for player, by the way, it can be pick and prospect to get to still stay in the round and get a player. That's going to help you. It may not be that superstar a plus level acquisition. You know what I mean? But I haven't gone through the chat. I don't know if that idea is getting roasted, but I think that I'll give, we'll talk about it more in future episodes. And if people think it's stupid, that's cool. I get it. I understand, but I'm, that's where I'm leaning, man. That's where I'm leaning right now. And I still think that you can help the team with prospects. You know, it's a, it's a seven round draft. You can get usable players early on day two and we'll see where it goes, man. You good? 906. I know people want us to keep going. There's some people that don't even want to watch the game tonight, but I know that you, so the reason that we can't is that Matthew has a job that, he, that is, that involves him watching the game, preferably live. And I don't think and, we would even be allowed to have a live stream while like we couldn't be talking about the game. There would be some sort of. We could react to but... it, but we couldn't like play by play. Like you could react right. and we could do that. But even then, I think we're kind of getting dangerously close to getting our PP slapped. Yeah. And quote the nobody great wants Timothy that. Murray. No, not at all. Not I got to say, all. though. I do much... enough of that yeah. on my own. No, I'm scared. I got to say <laughs> this trading the pick seed here that you've planted is uh it's got me excited for the off-season editions of the baker fairburn hockey show because excited as good as the the game chats have been we haven't had a lot of great hockey to talk about this season but this off-season is going to be a uh, as interesting in buffalo as it is you know anywhere across the league and so hopefully we'll be we're gonna have some fun with it i think here 
we will have an episode where I'd like the chat to bring their individual proposals for what that deal could be. We'll do a whole episode on that. I mean, we'll dissect it and see who has the best one. And that'll be the official recommendation. The, uh, what do you call it? Endorsement of the Baker Fairburn hockey show. I'll slip it under Kevin Adams door. There you go. Hey. Yeah. There you there go. You go. All right, 9.08, I'm going to get you out of here so you can go to work. Um, that's it. No grand closure. Thanks, everyone, for hopping in. As always, we appreciate you coming in, and it just gets better every week. So, um, we, yeah, that's it. I'm, I, I'm going to get us out of here. For Matthew Fairburn from The Athletic, for the production crew who needs to, to Matthew's point earlier, invest in some servers so we don't go down because of too many prospects lagging my computer. I'm Chris Baker. We'll see you again very soon ahead of the next uh, homestand here for the Buffalo Sabres. Have a good night, everyone.